All right, Matthew 6, 6. It says, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. And we're looking at this idea, we started it really last week, about secret prayer. A place of secret prayer. And how we each need that. That's necessary to have a strong Christian life. Is to have that quiet place, that prayer closet, as the Lord put it. But thou, when thou prayest, go into thy closet. And how important it is that we would have that prayer closet. It's an absolute necessity to a healthy Christian life. We looked at last week that really secret prayer should be done in the morning. And, you know, the Lord never gave specific times when to pray. We saw that. But he did mention it as though he expects us to do it. Not that it's going to be something that we don't do. He says, but thou, when thou prayest. He didn't command it, but it's almost as if he did. He didn't tell us when you have to do it. But he does expect us to do it. It's expected from his followers is we're to be disciples. And really the Sermon on the Mount, we could say this is really the path that a disciple should follow. And a disciple means to be a follower of Christ. So as we follow him, the pattern that he laid out before us throughout his life while he was here on this earth was a pattern of secret prayer. I mean, Paul penned the words, you know, that we should pray without ceasing. I mean, just have a, a, an attitude, a life of prayer. It should just be something that just always happens. It's never like weird or, or odd to pray. That's what Paul expected. And that's what the Lord did. He lived a life of prayer. He laid that example down for us. And he says, but thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father, which is in secret. See, now, the Sermon on the Mount isn't just to, to unbelievers, to lost people. He's talking to saved people, people that have been born again by the Spirit of God. Otherwise, you can't call Him Father. When thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father, which is in secret. So in that statement alone, He's implying something. He's implying that one must be saved that one must be born again, that one must know Jesus Christ as their Savior, that there has to have come a time in that person's life when they realized that they were a wicked sinner deserving of hell. And that's exactly what they deserved. Because the Bible says that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Well, if we don't think we're lost, then we don't need saving, do we? And I talked about it on Sunday night. We get there looking at the gospel, the gospel defined for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 4, and it says that he died for our sins. See, there was a reason he came to die. He died for our sins because we've sinned against him. That's the reason why he came. He came to pay a debt he did not owe. And because that debt that's on each and every one of us, there's a penalty. And that penalty is the lake of fire. The Bible says all liars are going to the lake of fire. Now, most of us like to think I'm a good person. I'm not bad. I've told a lie, but everybody has. I've stolen a few things, but everybody has. But in Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, God says that all liars are going to the lake of fire. Let's turn there. I want us to, to see that. Don't take my word for it. And it's not just liars, because most people think that, hey, it's just, you know, the really bad people are the ones going to hell. Not me. I'm a good person. Well, here it says, Revelation 21, 8, but the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable. I mean, that's just the most wicked of the wicked. 
murderers. We say, I'm not a murderer. We learn different from that as we've gone through the Sermon on the Mount there. Matthew chapter 5 talked about that. Anyway, moving on. Murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers. You say, I'm not a witch. I don't practice witchcraft and idolaters. Anybody that's put anything before God is an idolater. And get this, look in that list of wicked sins right there. And all liars shall have their part in the lake, which burneth with fire and brimstone. That's what God says is going to happen to all liars. They're going to the same place as murderers, as whoremongers, as idolaters, as unbelievers. They're all going to the same place. That's why Jesus told Nicodemus, a religious man that was teaching the word of God to people. He was a teacher and instructor of the Bible. People would have gone to him like he went to Jesus. They would have gone to him and said, master, I mean, teacher. But Nicodemus snuck away at night where no one would see him. And he came to Jesus. He said, master, we know thou art sent from God. No man can do these miracles thou doest except God be with him. And this is what he tells Jesus. And Jesus says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. But he's a religious person. I mean, he's, he's there teaching. He's like a preacher. He's teaching the word of God. And Jesus said, you must be born again. And that's what he has to say to every one of us. You must be born again. That denotes a conversion experience. Some people say, I've talked to a lot of people. We go out, share the gospel with them. I've talked to a lot of people and they, they'll say that, you know, I've always been a Christian. Eh, sorry, too, 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 wrong, too long. That's wrong. You can't have always been a Christian because Jesus said you must be born again. And he said the only way you can be saved is if you can call upon the name of the Lord. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That leaves out infant baptism right there. Does nothing for you. Because you have to be able to call on the name of the Lord. You have to. So when did you come to that realization in your life that you needed the Lord? That you were wicked and undone and you were on your way to the devil's hell. And you needed a Savior. And Jesus was the only one. That's what's implied when he says, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou shut thy door, pray to thy Father, which is in secret. Your Father. You see, go to John 1, 12 with me if you would now. John chapter 1, verse 12. I love John chapter 1, just a great verse right there. It proves the deity of Jesus Christ. John 1, 1, I just, 1, 1 through 3 is just awesome. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all, all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. We know, go to Genesis 1, and God's the one that created everything. Well, whoever this Word was, was God. That's what the Bible says right there. And verse 14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Bam, right there, the deity of Jesus Christ. The fact that Jesus Christ is God. So there go the, the, the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Muslims that all deny that Jesus Christ is God. Out the window right there. But here's what he goes on to say as he's describing Christ right here. Verse 9, That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, get this, and his own received him not. He came to the Jews, and the Jews didn't receive him. Get this, but as many as received him, to them, so the ones that received him, he does something for them. To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So you have to receive Christ, and that's when you become a son of God. That's when he becomes your father, when you've received him. It's not talking about receiving him in a wafer, communion table. That's not what it's talking about. You have to receive his death, burial, and resurrection as full payment for your sin. You receive him. You're receiving that person as your Savior. Because even to them that believe on his name, that's what it's talking about. He defined it for us right there in the text. You've got to believe on him. Trust him. You say, I believe in Jesus. So did I growing up my whole life. I believed in Jesus. And I was going to die and go to hell. I had a devil's faith. You see, the Bible says in James chapter 2, the devils believe also and tremble. They know about Jesus. They know what he did. They'll still go to hell. It's more than just knowing about him up here. You've got to trust him fully in here. 
take off in an airplane, you're trusting the airplane to save your life. That's faith. That's what that belief is talking about, fully trusting Him. That's what Jesus is implying when He says, Pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. So what we're talking about here is we have this place of secret prayer. It's for a saved person, a person that knows Jesus Christ as their Savior. Someone that has received Him. A disciple. That's who He's talking to. And He says, you pray to your Father in secret, and the, your, thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. And we looked at, at a few weeks back about those that went and they wanted to pray and make a big thing about it. And they, they did it all before men. They sound the trumpet and everything. And it says, as, uh, Thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Oh, they just want to make a big thing about it. And everybody look at them. Look at me. I'm praying now. And they want to make a big old deal about it. Have anybody seen people, uh, a lot of the Jews praying at the Wailing Wall? You see them going, you ever seen them at the Wailing Wall there? The Western Wall in Jerusalem? The, the city of David there? You'll see them there doing things like this, and, and they're just standing there and, and making a big show about it. Everyone can see them. And Jesus is talking about people doing things like that, and he's saying, hey, they have their reward, and their reward's to be seen of men. And everyone's like, oh, wow, look at him. That's their reward. That's what they get. But God says to us, hey, we go to him in prayer, secret prayer. He says, I'm going to reward you openly. But no one's going to see you praying. And prayer takes work. Amen. Anybody ever fallen asleep praying? I'll, I'll raise my hand on that one. I have. That, I'm telling you, most of the praying I do, I, I won't really kneel down unless I know it's going to be like a prayer time we'll have here. I'll kneel down and pray. Or I, I've tried laying prostrate. doesn't work. I'll fall asleep if it's more than like 10 minutes. It just doesn't work. So when I pray, I'm, I've told you all before, but I, I'll walk back and forth. I prayed for hours walking around in this building before, walking around all these seats just right here, walking around the outside right here. Why? Because it just it doesn't let me fall asleep. It's a prayer closet. You say, but people can see. It doesn't matter. It's a private place for you and God. I'm t if you need your prayer closet to be at a park, walking around a park, go do it there. But have that secret place. We need it. The health of your Christian life needs it. For you to be effective for the Lord, you need it. You've got to have it. Your Christian life's health depends on it. So we could do it in the morning. We looked at it last week. Now, secret prayer should be done in the evening. And again, this isn't like hard and fast rules that you have to do this. You have to do that. These are just suggestions here. But it makes sense that when the day comes to an end, what's more natural than to give thanks and, and beg God for forgiveness for ways you've sinned against Him? The end of the day. I know some people just pick the morning. Some people just pick the night. Look, I'm not getting mad at you. If you do one or the other, just do one. Amen? Pick one. Middle of the day, I don't care. Just pick one where you have a, a private time with the Lord. Take time to pray for a blessing on the labor of your day, what you've done. I mean, that's good to do in the morning, too. God, bless what I'm about to do. At the end of the day, God, bless what I did. God, thank you for keeping me safe. Thank you for the health I have. Thank you for providing for my family, Lord. And then use that as a time. Pray for the members of your family. Pray for, for wisdom for them. You know, I've heard people say, older than me, say it's easier to have young children at home than it is grown children on their own. Because when they're young children at home, you have more control over them. When they grow up and they move out on their own, you see them making these disastrous mistakes, and you can warn them, but you can't make them do anything. I imagine that would be a lot harder. I'm not looking forward to that day. Hopefully the disasters aren't too bad. Amen? But look, pray for them even still as they're out of your house. Pray for God to guide them, God to work in their life. Maybe pray for their salvation if they're not saved. Pray that God would bring them to Him. But when I pray for people's salvation, my family members, God, whatever it takes, bring them to you. 
Whatever it takes to get their attention, bring them to you. Because I'd rather have an eternity in heaven with them than them have, to, than them have temporal blessings here and everything good here and they die and go to hell for eternity. I'd rather have them in heaven for eternity. So ask God's blessing on what you've done for that day. James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So every good gift and perfect gift, it comes from above. God sends that down. God sends it down on us. So ask Him for it. Ask Him to bless what we've done. Ask Him for wisdom to deal peaceably, gently, mercifully with those we come in contact with. Because that's not always easy to do. I was just speaking with a coworker today, and he was talking about uh, just driving on his motorcycle. And he's like, some of the worst people here, they don't ever see you. He says, I just assume nobody sees me. He says, and sometimes they'll, they'll cut you off and everything else. And he says, I just, you know, I wave to him in an unfriendly way, he, 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 he mentioned to me. I think you get what I mean. He says, that's what I do to them. See, that's not how we should respond. But our flesh says, that's, man, that person, get them. That's what our flesh naturally says. So it's good to pray, God, help me deal with things peaceably, gently. I mean, if you know there's like strife at work or something or at school, pray about it before you get there. Lord, give me wisdom in how to deal with this thing, with this situation that's going on. Help me not be in my flesh when I have to deal with this. Whenever there's confrontation, I mean, you know, if you're going to have to confront somebody about a certain situation, best thing to do, Lord, pray, help me. Please, God, I need you to guide me, guide the words that I say. Help me not get in my flesh and say something I shouldn't, do something that I shouldn't. God, I need your direction. I need your wisdom. Lord, help me with that. James 3.17 says, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure. Then it's peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Man, the, the wisdom that's from above comes pure and peaceable, gentle. Wisdom from above. You know, as we talk about seeking God in secret prayer in the evening, knowing that we may wake in eternity, What's more proper than to really just commend ourselves, give ourselves to the care of the one who never slumbers or sleeps? Doesn't that make sense? That's how I want to go. Amen. If I can go, if it's not in the rapture, I want to go in my sleep and I just wake up and I see Jesus. Amen right there. That's what I want to do. Too bad we don't get to pick how it happens. But that's how I would like it to happen. But we commend ourselves to him, give ourselves to him. You know, we have to train ourselves to think like this, to, to really think of God as the last thing when we go to bed. You know, I think it's a great thing to, as I just said, you know, how many of us have fallen asleep praying, but I think it's, it is a good thing with, to fall asleep praying, talking to God, and not be the last thing that you were saying, and you just fall asleep like that. That's a good thing right there, if you've already had that secret. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If you've already had that time where you're supposed to, and that wasn't supposed to be it, you know, if, if your idea of secret prayer is like, all right, I'm going to bed, oh, it's 10.30, I'll go to bed now and I'll pray now while I'm laying down. I'm telling you, that lasts like 30 seconds, right? <laughs> or if you say, I'm going to pray in the morning, but you don't actually get out of bed, it's just like you just fall back asleep. At least I do. Anybody else? Maybe one other person's honest? Okay. Amen. All right. <laughs> We should find our place of secret prayer, even in times of embarrassment and confusion. Such times are going to happen in all of our lives. And it's a privilege and duty to go to God and seek His direction. When we don't know what to do, when maybe something's happened, we're embarrassed, and we don't know the next step, really the best thing we should do is seek His direction. David, when he was at Ziklag, I think of that story, it's just amazing to me. When King David was there, he was going to go fight really against Israel, fight with, with God's people's enemies. He was willing to fight with them. And God spared him from that and said, David, you know, the Philistines, the other, uh, you know, generals or, or kings of the Philistines didn't want David to do that. So 
They said, no, no, you send him back. So he got sent back. And as they were going back, they see smoke coming from the, the town that had been given to them, him and his, his mighty men. And that's not a good thing in Bible times when you see the town, you know, on fire and smoke coming out of it. Um, and they get there and they're all their, their, their wives, their children, everything's taken and the, the, their homes are burned down to the ground. And David's at such a low point. His men are getting ready to kill him. They were about to kill him. But the Bible says David encouraged himself in the Lord. What does that mean, he encouraged himself in the Lord? I, I'd like to say he went to his prayer closet and said, God, help. And that is, if you read the story he did, he said, God, should we go up? We go up and get them. And God said, go. And they got them. They, everyone, no one was killed. They got every, everyone back and all the things that were taken, it was all given back to them. But David encouraged himself in the Lord. He, he sought God's guidance in a time of confusion and stress. And that's what we, as, as Christians, we have to train ourselves to think like that, where we, something catastrophic happens, we have to pull ourselves back and not just react. And I know sometimes there's situations where you have to immediately make a decision and those are forced upon all of us and we can't do anything about that. But when something catastrophic happens, sometimes we just need to maybe just take a second step back and think things through and ask God, God, what do I do? God, help me guide my next steps. See, this really what we're talking about here is just how a Christian should live all the time. Not that God's, you know, an afterthought. He's, he's on the back burner. And if I get around to you, God, okay, maybe. You know, maybe some of us have seen that picture going around. What if we treated our Bibles like we treated our phones and we carried them everywhere and we, we went back home if we forgot it? I mean, how many of us have forgot our phone and, and we, oh, I forgot my phone. We turn around and go get our phone. We got to have our phone, right? Why don't we treat our walk with God like that? Oh, I, I got to have that prayer time. How many of you have spent an hour or more on this, just on Facebook, reading something, some articles, whatever? An hour or more, just gone. How many of you have done that? I'll raise my hand first, okay? I have done that. All right, some of us. I did that. Okay, we've all done it, right? It's easy to do, but it's hard. I don't know why. It's hard to spend an hour in prayer. It's not always. There's been times it's been very easy, but sometimes it's prayers work. I'm telling you, we can go look at, at when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, sweating great drops of blood, and he says, I need you guys to pray with me. And he goes off and prays, and he comes back, and they're all asleep. It happened to them too, amen? It's not just us. He says, what, could you not watch with me one hour? And he leaves again three times. Now, I mean, I'll give the guys some credit. It's happening. This, all this is going down. We don't always realize what's happening there in the Bible, but all of this is happening. It's like, you know, 11 midnight when all this is happening. It's, it's late at night, and these guys are tired, no doubt. So prayer takes work. That's why we have to deny our flesh. We have to tell ourselves no sometimes, or, or sometimes it's telling ourselves, yes, you need to do this. That's why, I, personally, I believe the best time to spend in prayer to God is early in the morning. You wake, wake up early and spend that time with Him, because then the, if you don't, the day just gets going and you miss it, and it doesn't happen, it doesn't take place. But we need to seek God like David did at Ziklag, like, like Saul on the road to Damascus, who was later to become the Apostle Paul. Um, God kind of set that thing up, but I'm telling you, he, he, he sought God, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? What do you want me to do then, Lord? As soon as he knew, he was asking. When he was blinded, Daniel, the three Hebrews unwilling to eat the king's meat, he said, wait, 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 can, can you just give this a shot? Just let us try this. He said, okay, we'll let you try it. They handled it wisely. And then later, when they were going to kill everyone another time, couldn't interpret the, the king's dream or whatever it was. I forget. Uh, I'm mixing those two stories up there in Daniel. 
But they said, wait, wait, give us time. And, and he says, I need you guys to start fasting and praying so God can give us an answer to this, so God can show me what's going on. But a time of confusion. And they sought God. That's when we find that place of secret prayer. We spend special time dedicated to that. It said in the most difficult and embarrassed time of the American Revolution, George Washington was seen to retire daily to a grove in the vicinity of the camp at Valley Forge. And curiosity led a man to observe him on one occasion. And the father of his country was seen on his knees supplicating the God of hosts in prayer. He wanted to see what was happening. What's, what's you know, General Washington doing here every evening? Where's he going? He just goes for a walk out there. And he went and he saw him down on his knees uh, begging God, asking God. And how can any of us tell how much the liberty of this nation is owed. So maybe that man's seeking God in prayer. We should also find that place of secret prayer when we're faced with strong temptations. As I said before, our Savior prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was about to face a huge trial. Let's look at that. Go to Matthew 26, if you would. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 40. He knew what was coming before him. Verse 39 says, And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. He, he knew this was going to be hard. And what did he do? What was his plan when he was faced with temptation? He, he sought God out. He said, Lord, help me. I don't want to go through this. But not my will, thine will be done. See, he showed us how you handle your flesh. That you take it to God when that temptation comes. Verse 40, and he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep and saith unto Peter, what, could you not watch with me one hour? I've always found that funny that he goes to Peter. He, they're all asleep, but he goes to Peter. Do you not watch with me one hour? Why are you asleep? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. See, prayer is the answer to a weak flesh. How come I succumb to this sin all the time? How come I'm continually uh, failing in this area? Probably because you don't pray. That's probably why. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. See, you want to do right. You want to make the right decisions. You want to follow the Lord. You want to do all these things. They wanted to stay up and pray with him, but the flesh was weak. So watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. So when faced with strong temptations, we need to seek God. We need to pray. This is when we find that secret place of prayer, that prayer closet. Uh, yes, it should be, I believe, regularly every day, but then also in, in other times when there's extraordinary circumstances. I mean, when the, the Jews were about to be annihilated by, uh, by who was it, Haman. There and, and Mordecai goes to Esther and says, you've got to go to the king. You've got to go before the king. And she says, well, tell the, tell the Jews to fast. Tell everyone to fast. And that's exactly what she did. And they sought the Lord by prayer and fasting. And then she went before the king. And that was a serious thing because it could mean her life. You weren't allowed to go before the king unless he summoned you, wife or not. So she knew that could mean her life to go do that. Now, see, in our culture, we don't understand something like that. We say, what wife can't go to her husband? That's not how it was then, though. Something serious. So they sought God in prayer during that difficult situation. None of us are immune to temptation. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 10, 13, if you would, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. I like this one. This is hope right here. God gives hope if you're struggling with something, if you've Maybe succumb to temptation. God's giving hope. He says this, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. 
But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. God will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. That word suffer means allow. He'll make a way of escape. God will do that for us. If we're daily in secret prayer, I'm going to tell you what, it's going to make that way of escape a lot easier to take. Because there may be times when you've seen that way of escape and you said, no. But if we're in secret prayer, it's going to make it easier. Because, hey, the spirit indeed is willing. The spirit says, yes, I want that. But the flesh is weak and says, nah, get back over here. Spirit needs to be strong. We need to strengthen our spirit. That happens through prayer. Prayer and the word of God. We just sang that song. Come and dine, the master calleth, come and dine. You may feast at Jesus' table all the time. Talking about right here. The Christian life is really very basic. There's not a lot to it. I mean... Read your, we sing that kid's song, read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, 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 and you'll grow, grow, grow. I mean, that's it. It's, that's, that's it. Right there. You want to be a strong Christian, read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. I mean, be in this. Eat, eat this. Feast on this. Let this grow you. Let this teach you. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What mind? This mind. This book. That we would think like this. And talk to him. That's, that's Christianity in a nutshell right there. That's discipleship in a nutshell right there. Read your Bible and pray. And I mean, in reading your Bible, it's talking about studying it, learn it. I mean, rightly divide the word of truth. All those things are implied in that. But that's it. Read this thing. And pray. Talk to God. Seek him. He'll strengthen you so that you're strong in the inner man. So when the temptation does come, you see the way of escape, and you're like, I'm out of here, just like Joseph did. When that temptation came before him, and he's there, he's sold as a slave, and he's working there in Potiphar's house, and Potiphar's wife, that wicked woman, she says, hey, come lay with me, and she keeps telling him and pressing him day in and day out, day in and day out, and finally a time comes when, when all the other workers and the slaves aren't in the house, and it's just her and Joseph, and she, she grabs him, and she says, come on. And what does he do? He, he runs. He gets out of her grasp, and he leaves his coat there, and he runs out. What? He sought the way of escape. He said, how can I sin against my God? Do this wicked thing and sin against my God. But then that means we have a view to see sin as evil and wicked, not something we entertain, not something we hold on to, not something we want and we desire. I mean... If anybody had opportunity, Joseph did. I don't know how old he was exactly at that time. It could have been maybe early on into him being there. I, I, I would say he's probably 20 or younger. When he's there, he got sent there when he was 17. He's probably 20 or younger. And he, he's got this woman there. And likely, I mean, Potiphar was a, a, a leader and he's a man of power, so... I'm just assuming, we don't know, but based on the way the story's put forth, she was probably a beautiful woman. And she's throwing herself at him. His parents aren't there to say, don't do that. His rabbi's not there telling him, don't do that. His older brothers aren't there telling him, don't do that, that's wrong. It's just him and his God. That's it. And he has this opportunity laid before him. I mean, he, he even said, he told her, he said, I, I have command over everything in this house except you. That's the, what Potiphar had given him. He trusted him that much. He was, God blessed him that much, and God was wor at work in his life that much that he always got lifted to the top. And that's how he becomes, you know, second in command only to the uh, Pharaoh. Because God just lifts him up because he's a man of honor and integrity and character. 
but he had the opportunity. And what did he do? He, he, he found the way of escape. God gave him the way of escape and he got out. He ran, he left. And guess what? Because of that, he was thrown in prison again. Because he did right. Just because you do right doesn't mean the consequences always come out good for you. Don't get discouraged in that because in all that, God had a plan. But I'm telling you, he was able to do that because he walked with God. Because he had a place of secret prayer. There's two people in the Bible that it never mentions anything negative about their character. It doesn't mean they weren't sinners. But God, for whatever reason, chose not to mention anything negative about their character. It was Joseph and Daniel. And both of them were in situations like that without any parents over them. And they chose to do right. They fled the temptation. Now, it doesn't mean they weren't sinners because the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And all means all. So none of us are immune to temptation, but if we are walking with God, it's going to make that way of escape that God promises to give much easier to take. If we give in to temptation, it will lead to death and destruction. Go to James chapter 1, verse 14, please. James 1, 14. It says, but every man, not some men, not most men, every man. So this applies to everybody. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Drawn away of our own lust and enticed. And when lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. The end result of giving in to temptation is death. The wages of sin is death. It could be physical death. It could be the death of a relationship. The death of a job. And there's all kinds of ways we could apply this. I believe it's in context, it's speaking about physical death. And we could even say at the end of any sin, the end road is death. I mean, that's what God told Adam and Eve. You know, hey, you eat from the fruit of this tree, the day you eat thereof, you're surely going to die. And they did die spiritually that day. And physical death came later. But praise God, our Savior gave victory over death. Amen, right there. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. He's done. That's the, the final end of it is through Jesus Christ. You can do away with death. Praise God for that. That's a good day. Amen. But look, let's not go running after it right now. Don't give in to your temptation. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. You know, there's so many ways in this life we can watch sin destroy somebody and bring about death. I think one of the worst things I've seen is watching someone die from cancer. Horrible. You slowly watch them turn into a skeleton. And slowly, I mean, sometimes it's years, sometimes it's like within a month. But even then, it's, it's, it's I know a month is fast, but... It's slow in regard to it's not just like that, like someone in a freak accident and they're dead. It's horrible. You watch them waste away and slowly die. And there's so many ways we can watch death be brought about, and I'm telling you, it's all the cause of sin. Every heartache, every horrible thing in this world that we face is a result of sin. You can always boil it back to sin, and that's just what God promised. The wages of sin is death. You can count on it. 
That's why Christ came, to give us eternal life, to give life, do away with the curse. And one day he's coming back and he will do away with that curse. Praise God for that. But look, if we want to avoid this temptation that can destroy and ruin things, destroy our life, even bring about our physical death, we need a place of secret prayer. We have to have that place of secret prayer. Do you have a place of secret prayer where you commune regularly with God? When do you have it? Ask yourself, when, when do I have that? Lord, when do I go to you regularly? If not, you need it. You've got to have it. You might think, I'll be okay, I'm all right. And some parents think, I've got salvation, I'm okay. And they don't live, live it like they should. And they allow sin in. And I'm telling you, they might be saved, but what it's going to do, it's going to bring death to their children. Their children won't know the Lord. And their children are going to waltz into hell. For us to be strong spiritually and to be disciples of Christ, we have to have this place of prayer. We need it. I need it. You need it. If, if God's to lead us and guide us and help us make the right decisions, we have to talk with Him. We have to hear from Him. That's why it's important that we read our Bibles, pray every day, and we'll grow, grow, grow. I mean, that's it. That simple. When's your time with the Lord? When you read your Bible and when you pray, do you have it? And you need, it needs to be on your schedule. I mean, it's that important that you'll push other things aside. You say, I need this. You say, but my family, I got to take my kids to games and all this stuff and all that. That's secondary. The important thing is this is what your family needs. This is what my wife needs. This is what my husband needs. This is what my children need. This is what my lost coworkers need me to be. So I can be led of God. This is what my lost family needs so I can be led of God to win them to Him. We need that spiritual strength, and it only comes through reading our Bibles and secret prayer. We have to have it. When's your time? If you don't have one, you need to make one. It's that important to your life, to your spiritual health. Let's pray. Lord.